So I was uh, talking, I don't know, it was maybe a year, year and a half ago with uh, some folks from our media team and they were letting us know, um, letting me know that <clears throat> we have tracking with us at one time or another people from 35 different countries um, that actually watch online or tune in somehow on the archives or whatever. And so I'm... I'm I'm really kind of cognizant of the fact that when I'm talking, I'm talking to people from a lot of different places. And, uh, and so, given that, I know we have a lot of people that, uh, that watch the broadcast um, because the ABC affiliate here, Channel 7, uh, takes that into Canada, and so we have a lot of Canadian folks that watch. We have some Canadian folks that drive in uh, to come worship with us. And so, uh, so I recognize that. And for those of you maybe that are watching in other places and other countries, um, you'll hear me maybe refer to some things regarding America because we are, uh, in just a few days, celebrating our nation's birthday. And it's the right thing to be able to do, and we're celebrating um, this really young nation uh, whose birthday is, I think, about the 236th birthday or so, um, which for nations is a very young nation. And uh, we celebrate that. Now, there's lots of ways that we celebrate that. You're going to hear uh, fire fireworks probably right across the border. Um, if you're in Canada, you're going to hear shooting off fireworks. There's going to be a lot of uh, uh, grilling that's going on. Uh, there's going to be a lot of American flags that are going to be waving. And all of that's beautiful because we, we love the fact that God has allowed us to live in a nation like we live in with the freedoms that we have been given. And so we celebrate our freedom every single year and we do so um, gladly and willingly and gratefully because we live in a wonderful, wonderful country. Don't you agree? It really, is, it really is a privilege and a responsibility to live in a place like we live in in the United States of America. Now, it's interesting because the birth of America is really um, reasonably unique. It's not so unique in that it was, um, you know, that there was a revolution and those kinds of things. Sometimes uh, countries start that way, uh, desiring their freedom. It was unique in the sense that there was a pretty significant influence as it related to the Christian faith in the beginnings of our nation's history. Now, um, it wasn't necessarily completely based upon the Christian faith in our nation's history, but many of the founders, uh, certainly not all of them, uh, a number of them had very differing views on the nature of who God was. And just because you see um, or hear God referenced in some of the early documents that we have, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're talking about the God of the Bible as revealed in Jesus that we talk about. Some of them had a different kind of perspective on that. Not all of them. Some of them had a real vibrant uh, Christian faith. But I've heard people make the argument as a result of that, that really genuinely America is a Christian nation. And I guess it would depend on how we define what a Christian nation actually is, whether we could answer that yes or no. Uh, because depending on how we defined it might be the way that we answered the question. If we were defining, is America a Christian nation based on the majority of people that make up the population of our country are legitimate, serious followers of Jesus, then the answer to, is America a Christian nation, is of course no. Now, if, if we're defining um, it as, do, um, do the governments and the legal entities interpret law through the lens of a biblical worldview and through the lens of a Christian faith worldview, then the answer's probably also no, at least generally speaking, although there's some that do that. If we were defining it based on what do most people in this country affiliate themselves with, at least culturally speaking, then maybe the answer would be yes, that we would be defined as a Christian nation. So it really just kind of depends on how we say it. Um, the truth is there are some people that are saying, yeah, it's a Christian nation, and there's others that argue absolutely not, it's not a Christian nation. And... Uh, you know, for me, it's a little more nuanced than that. I, I usually use a definition. When somebody talks about a Christian nation, um, you know, I, I just don't know that we're going to understand what that looks like until Jesus comes up, comes back and sets up shop, right? 
When somebody asks me, what kind of government are you for? I'm for the government that is upon his shoulders, as the scripture says. That's the one that I'm for, ultimately, at the end of the day. But I'm praying for the one that we've got. And I'm praying for the ones that are in the nations. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, America is, um, is or is not a Christian nation. I don't really know the answer to that question. It depends on how you define it. But what I can say is this. From the birth of our nation till now, the talk of God has never been far from America. Talk of God in general has never been at a distance when it comes to this idea um, of our country. Now, if you've paid attention in recent times, in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of talk about God and America, even real recently. Um, I know one of the, one of the folks that was um, trying to get a presidential nomination that did not succeed uh, put out a book about rediscovering God in America. That was a part of kind of, uh, of his, little, his platform. Um, there was another PBS special called God in America. I don't know if you saw it or if you didn't. They tried to track kind of um, the religious affiliation of God and his representation in America. There's a movie that uh, came out not too long ago that basically talks about uh, what the foundations of our founding fathers were talking about. And it's a little more nuanced than what I think the movie uh, gave it credit for, um, at least in some of the things that I've read. But nonetheless, there was a movie talking about these things. Um, there's also a book that's for six months has been on the New York Times bestseller list that's about uh, America and about some, um, some signs that say that America uh, is getting some signals about God's judgment similar to that of Israel. Um, so you've got a lot of talk in our nation about God and America, and I think that's at least something that gives us some dialogue because we're asking the question, what's God's place in America? Where does God fit in in America? And we're going to look in just a minute in the book of Joshua, uh, and you can, you know, if you're trying to thumb around or find your place there, you can find your place in Joshua chapter 5 if you like. And we're going to be there in just a few moments, not quite yet. Um, but talk of God in America is an interesting conversation because at the end of the day, here's what maybe is unsaid, here's what maybe is not stated, but in fact is a question that I hear in a variety of realms often, and it's this question, is God for us in America? Is God for us in America as Americans? Is he for our nation? There are some people that, um, that have argued and do argue vehemently that God is for America. There are other people that argue just as vociferously that God is not for America. Either way, here's ultimately the question that both parties are trying to get at, it's this. Is God for us? And I think that that's an interesting question that sometimes comes up in real innocent ways. You know, um, both of my boys are baseball players. Uh, they're pretty good. You know, we'll see. They're, they're still pretty young, and so they're developing. And, but they're pretty good ball players, and they're ha they have a lot of fun playing. And, um, and I have a lot of fun that they like baseball because baseball is my sport. That's the sport that I love. It's a sport that I appreciate. It's a sport that I do a lot of watching, and I do a lot of coaching as it relates to baseball. Uh, there's some other sports Man, you put me out on lacrosse. I have no idea what's going on. Dudes with sticks and balls, I dig that. Uh, but, you know, I would just be like throwing them at people. No, you throw the net, man. Okay, whatever. So I don't, there's not a lot. I, don't, I couldn't coach hockey. I don't know how to do that. I, I can't even skate. I'm from Georgia. <laughs> I can't ice skate. I've been out. I've tried it with my boys. They picked up real quickly. I can't do it. I can snow ski. I can't ice skate. I just get out there and it's like, I'm, I've rolled my ankle so many times playing ball, you know, that I just, I'm out there just going like this. <laughs> and I, I realize you got to tighten those things, you know, because normally it just, I'm no good at it. Baseball, I like. Baseball I was okay at. Baseball I coach. Baseball I watch. Oftentimes at a game, because I'm at fields a lot, uh, people know, you know, because of the teams that we're on and that kind of stuff, um, I know a lot of the families, and they know what I do. You know, there's no hiding, right? So I can't be out there throwing my hat and kicking people and doing all that stuff, right? Uh, I'm out in the community, and people know what I do, right? Uh, it's the, he's the pastor guy. Inevitably, inevitably, it happens, we're sitting around watching a ball game and you know our team's losing and I'm sitting over there in the stands and inevitably somebody's always gonna pipe up with one of these. Uh, Pastor Jerry, seems like it's about, start, about time to start praying. <laughs> we need a few runs here. 
See if you might could, uh, you may need to start praying, you know. Now, innocently enough, what they're saying is this. It seems as if the right thing is that God is on our team, not on their team. God is on our team. And if we will just talk to him a little bit longer and a little bit more, then God's gonna work it out for us. Because he doesn't give a rip about those guys, right? Now, I know that's not what people are actually trying to say, and it comes out kind of innocently, but at the end of the day, that's kind of actually what is happening. And that's a silly illustration, but that illustration is indicative. It belies actually a mode of thinking that we have in our minds that kind of have this idea that, that God is actually for us in terms of us as Americans or our team or whatever. And then Americans have this kind of cultural Christianity, maybe it's not a true heart following of Jesus, that has this idea that, oh yeah, you know, God's kind of, he's the God of America, he's kind of our God, he's kind of the Christian God, right? Yeah, hey, that's our guy, he's, uh, he's kind of for us. So that bleeds over from baseball teams and football teams into personal pleasure and into my wealth and happiness and into my job and ultimately to my nation, and it starts out seemingly innocently enough, but it can actually cause us to have a very warped view of the nature of who God is. We have to be careful with that. That's something that we ought to pay attention to. Now, in the United States, this isn't a new thing. This didn't happen just in recent years. This has been this way from the very beginning. When you look at how nuanced the founding fathers were in terms of the way that they viewed God, some of them were deists. They believed that there was a God, certainly who was a creator, but he was very distant from creation and all that kind of stuff. There were some of them that cut a lot of things out of their Bibles, founding fathers that did. There were others that were passionate followers of Jesus. You know, So it was, it was an interesting kind of mix even early on. But as the United States became what it is, it was, it was growing more and more as a new country, a country founded on freedom, it became a melting pot. And this melting pot gave a whole lot of different ideas to the nature of God and everybody kind of thinking that God is on their team. Maybe that was based in part in terms of um, ethnic identity or whatever, but that God was on their team. And so you've got this melting pot in the United States that's increasingly beginning to grow. And interestingly enough, in our state, the state of New York, immigration was extremely high because a lot of them came over uh, that were immigrants, came over through the harbor, right, on the other side of the state and came into this state. And it was real interesting, right before the Civil War time, there was incredible opportunity that people were experiencing in the state of New York in this real still fledgling country called the United States before the Civil War. But with that opportunity came a whole lot of violence and it was actually gang violence that was occurring, particularly in New York City. Uh, my clan, the Irish, were kind of in the middle of it, in fact. I don't take personal responsibility for it. Please, no one wanna fight me afterwards particularly if you're one of the other gangs, like Italians or whatever, right? So there were lots of different ethnic kind of folks that came in immigrating in here and there was a lot of gang-related activity. Now, there was a, a guy who wrote a book named Herbert Asbury and he wrote it in 1928 and the title of the book was The Gangs of New York. You've heard of it probably because you've heard of the movie, The Gangs of New York, that Martin Scorsese had directed. I haven't seen the movie, and just because I reference one does not mean it's a recommendation. Um, so I haven't seen the movie, but I do know some of what happened in the movie because I know some of the history. Now, I realize what Scorsese did with the film, and I haven't seen the film, but he took, I, from knowing some of the history, he took some personal liberties with some of that because he was making a movie, right? And that's what people do. But some of the history is interesting because it was relatively bloody and relatively violent in New York City when people were kind of vying for jobs and for territory and for, you know, just to make a living in a newfound place. That democracy survived is a pretty interesting phenomenon, just to be honest with you. But in the movie, there were two characters, one played by Daniel Day-Lewis and one played by Leonardo DiCaprio. Leonardo's character was named Amsterdam and Daniel Day-Lewis's character was named The Butcher. Great. They were both leading rival gangs. I think the butcher had killed Leonardo DiCaprio's dad. 
Um, and the butcher, they, they were kind of taking these off of, uh, off of real people. They may have been adjusting them a little bit. But I found it interesting. There was one part in the movie that I had been told about that I thought was quite interesting because they're about to go into this massive gang-related fight where DiCaprio's leading his group and Daniel Day-Lewis is gonna be leading his group and there's a, another guy who's kind of the sheriff, so to speak. He's not really, but they're all gonna be involved in this big gang fight and here's what they do before it. Take a look. Mighty Lord, you are the dagger in my hand. Guide my hand on this day of vengeance. We give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. You, the swift, cannot flee, or the strong escape. Let my sword devour till its thirst is quenched with blood, and my enemies sleep forever. For you are the Lord God of retribution. For the Lord crushes the wicked. The Lord is merciful, and his love endures forever. Amen. 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 Scorsese does something I think that's quite brilliant when he points out the interesting phenomenon that people have in that we are all going to God, believing that God is on our side, that he is going to take up our deal and that he's gonna help us to win this fight. And so you've got a variety of different people that are all coming into this big gang, vicious, ter terrible kind of fight. And they're all appealing to God like God is going to be on their side to give them victory in this. This is something that is at the subconscious level of so many people in our community and in all over the world that I think it's something that I just wanted to point out to you and maybe address so that you understand a little bit some a little bit of something about the nature of God. Now, I can't speak to this issue fully, but I do want to point out something from the book of Joshua where you found yourself in chapter 5. I want to point something out that I think is worth us noting so that we can get a maybe a little bit more proper perspective of the nature of God. But before I get to what I want to read, I want to give you some biblical context. I want to give you some perspective. You remember that Moses led the people out of Egypt, uh, the Israelites out of Egypt, and he crossed them over the Red Sea, and then they wandered around in the wilderness, and then eventually, before they ever made it to the land that God promised them, Moses died. You remember that, right? Moses had a protege, and his name was? Joshua, and Joshua was taking over for Moses, and now he was going to be leading the people, and so Joshua is leading the people, and God is saying to Joshua over and over and over again, be strong and courageous, for the Lord your God is with you. Be strong and courageous, for the Lord your God is with you. And some people go, man, Joshua must have been really full of courage. No, Joshua must have been scared to death, because God is telling him over and over and over again, right? Be strong and courageous. You, you don't usually say that to people who are, you know, when you're scared, it's people going, you can do it. You're good. You know, it's like, uh, you know. So Joshua's leading all of these people. He crosses over the Jordan. They build a, you know, kind of the stones of remembrance are there at the Jordan so that when everybody passed by, they'd be able to point to that and go, man, God was faithful and he brought us out. And they cross over and they're in this place called Gilgal and they're real close to Jericho. And Jericho, Jericho is going to be kind of the first stop on taking over the land tour with the Israelites because they were going to be preparing for battle. There were already people in the land that God had promised them, pagan people that were there. And Israel was going to have to come into this land and they were going to have to take it piece by piece. This is what God had called them to do. Now, they're at a place called Gilgal and they're gearing up, getting ready to be able to, um, to start the process of the battle. And as you might think, military strategy played a part in this and Joshua is commanding the Lord's army. And he's thinking to himself, okay, we're going to map this thing out. We're going to get ready in Jericho. It's completely walled in. What are we going to do here? And then God gives him in some instruction. Just exactly what you would think God would do to give him some military strategy right before he goes to battle. And here's what he says. Here's what I want you to do, Joshua. And Joshua's probably got pen and you know, uh, parchment and he's ready to go. Tell me, Lord, I'm ready to hear it. And he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to circumcise all the dudes. I'm sorry, what? Yeah, you heard me, circumcise all the dudes because uh, we circumcised all of their parents all the dads out in the, uh, out in the wilderness, but they've all died off and now this is a new generation and I want them to, so to speak, leave behind and cut away their past and things are going to begin brand new. So that's exactly what they did, which is part of what Gilgal means. It means kind of a, a cutting off or a putting away. 
And so that's what happened there. You can imagine that as an army, it set them back a few days, <laughs> right? I don't think I have to explain that to anyone, right? So it sets them back a little bit and they're just kind of hanging out, camping, you know, just going, man, um, Joshua, don't blow the horn for us to <laughs> get up and go yet. And that's not, no, 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 I'm gonna need a couple more days, right? Finally, they heal up, they observe Passover, and they are getting ready to go and tackle Jericho. And here's what Joshua is doing. Like a good general, like a good leader, Joshua is making his way outside and he is going to kind of survey Jericho. The walls were high. They seemed to be impenetrable. And he's looking at this entire place thinking to himself, okay, what are we gonna do? I'm plotting this out. I'm thinking through it. When all of the sudden something unique happens to Joshua, that's where we're picking up in Joshua 5, beginning in verse 13. It says, now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? In other words, he asked him this, whose side are you on? Neither, he replied. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. So Joshua's just being a leader. He's a leader that's being a leader. He goes out, he's surveying everything that's going on. He's taking a look at Jericho and what he needs to do. And there in front of him is a man standing with a sword and Joshua does something really interesting. I think he shows great leadership here. He doesn't run away. He walks up, addresses the man and says, let me ask you something, sir. Are you for us? Or are you for our enemies? Because you can imagine, he's thinking, I, I don't know this person. I'm not sure who this is. I know I don't know everybody that's in our camps, but this one doesn't look anything like us. And so maybe he's with the, who are you for? Whose side are you on? And the man responds by saying, neither. I'm the commander of the army of the Lord. Okay, pause right there for a second. I'm sure Joshua was pulling one of those cartoon moves, right? Right, he was doing that. It was like, I'm not sure what is going on right here. I don't know who this is. Let's ask the question for just a second. Who might this have been? Because there are some that might have immediately thought, this must be an angel. This, this must be an angel. It must be, in fact, the angel, the archangel Michael, because Michael is seen to be kind of a battling angel that we see in the Old Testament and even the New Testament scripture. We see Michael as that kind of, uh, that battling angel. So maybe this is Michael. Here's the problem. Joshua actually bows down to offer worship here. And angels do not receive worship. They won't let that happen in any moment. So if it's not an angel, is it, is it just some dude that he doesn't know and some guy, you know? Listen, if this is a guy and it's a guy who's really a man of God, a normal guy like me or you who's a man of God, there is no way he is going to receive worship from someone else. If, if you remember, there were people like Paul and, and Barnabas and those kind of folks, when they would go out and preach the gospel, there were people that sometimes responded to them like they were gods. Do you remember in, in Acts chapter number 14? It says this, when the crowd saw what Paul had done, he had done a miracle. They shouted in the Laconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. And Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they tore their clothes and they rushed out in the crowd shouting, men, why are you doing this? We too are only men, human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. You see, any man of God that's a normal human being like me and you, we would never receive that kind of adoration. We would never do that, not in a million years. 
So if it wasn't an angel and it wasn't a regular dude, then who might this have been? Well, This is what some scholars have called a theophany. We might even be more specific in calling it potentially a Christophany where you've got what a Christophany would be is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. You're going, "Uh, what did you just say? Could you repeat that? Yeah. Incarnation means to put on flesh, right? So God incarnate in Jesus happened in Bethlehem. He put on flesh. He was incarnated, right? This would be a pre-incarnate. You're going, wait a minute. I thought he was born in Bethlehem. Oh, no. Jesus has always been. He's always been. And so could this have been? I'm not positive. Let me just go ahead and say, I'm not positive. All right? There's some things that are kind of mysterious to me about the word of God. But given that it doesn't appear that this is an angel... And it certainly doesn't appear that this is just some regular dude. I can't help but think that God has somehow acted in presenting himself in human form saying, I am a commander of the army of the Lord. And part of the clue for me in that is because of the, 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 um, the connectivity and the parallel to the burning bush with Moses. Just as Joshua now, who was a protege of Moses, you remember Moses when he, he, had, he had kind of a face-to-face with God at a burning bush, right? It's like God kind of appears to him and speaks to him in this burning bush. And now you've got this commander with sword drawn of the army of the Lord with Joshua standing in front of him. And this is no ordinary person and it's not probably an ordinary angel. This is God showing up in some way. Certainly it very well may be Jesus that's showing up in some way to Joshua. Now, the point of that is this, is that Joshua does what any good general would do and say this, whose side are you on? Joshua, who is representing the only in covenant nation with God, which is Israel, and he's asking the question, are you friend or foe? Are you on our side or their side? And here's what God, Jesus The commander of the army of the Lord says, no, neither. Wrong question. Next. Neither. Wait a minute. You're saying that the only in covenant nation that has ever existed to our knowledge, the only covenanted nation with God, Israel, as a nation, outside of what is called now the holy nation, which is the church, right? Which is all over the place, it's not a geography. But the only really geographic ethnic group of people that God was in covenant with Israel, and here's the question, whose side are you on? And he says, neither. You see, what I am sometimes concerned about is that we in the United States think that we have taken over a position that maybe God has never afforded to us. That we think that like some of our nations that we trade with, we give them most favored nation status, that we think that that is our status with God. That we in the United States have most favored nation status with God. As if we have taken over And we are a new nation that is in covenant with with God, like Israel was a nation in covenant with God. First of all, I don't know how you would draw that out of the scripture when America is only 236 years old. And I don't know if you knew this about the scripture, but it's older than that. (laughs) Just slightly, I'm just saying. I, I don't know where that would come from specifically, But I'm concerned that we have that kind of idea. It's interesting what what the commander of the army of the Lord says. Here's what he says. When, When Joshua asks, whose side are you on? Here's functionally what he says. I'm on my own side. I'm on my own side. Who are you for? I'm for myself. I'm on my own side. Now, You see, that's the interesting thing because what happens is that Joshua then goes, oh, oh, what does my Lord have to say to me? And here's what he says, take your shoes off because where you're standing is a holy place. You need to know whose presence you're in. This is a holy place. See, here's here's where I'm going somewhere with this. I want you to stay with me, all right? 
The doctrine of the holiness of God teaches us something. You see, for God to be holy, it means that he is completely distinct from us. It means he is, he is completely separate in a sense that there is no comparison. He is incomparable, right? The doctrine of the holiness of God teaches us that God is on his own side. That God is for himself. This is what the doctrine of holiness teaches us, that God is on his own side. Now, some of you are kind of, I realize, because my mind works the same way, that's a hard thing to swallow because we are conditioned not to like people who are all about themselves. Have you ever been around somebody who's just all about them? Have you ever been? So are you sitting next to them? Because this is not the time to look over at them and go, that's you. If you're thinking it, okay, but don't do it, right? Because that's embarrassing. It, you know it, you, raise your hand. Go ahead and confess to the pastor right now in front of everyone, it's you, right? So we don't, we don't like being around people that are all about themselves. I mean, we've been around them, right? It, usually the reason they're all about themselves is because they either have some glaring insecurity or they have some glaring deficiencies personally or emotionally or whatever that they're trying to compensate for. And so they want you to, they want you to have some trumped up version of who they are. And maybe it comes with all their stuff and they just want to always show you their stuff. Look at my stuff, look at my stuff. It's like, what, what are you talking about? Right? And they're all about themselves and we are conditioned to say, ugh, that is not what we want to be about. That is not the right thing. That is absolutely something that's, 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 that turns our stomach when we're around people that are just all about them. Another reason it's hard to swallow when we talk about God being for himself is that we feel like at its core, that's not very loving. Because what we've learned in the scripture, what we've learned in the revelation of what love looks like in the New Testament, do you remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 when it describes what love is? It says love isn't rude and it's what? It's not self-seeking, right? Love is not self-seeking. So we struggle sometimes to think about this idea of God being on his own side, of God being for himself, because for us, everything in us kind of goes, uh, it seems like maybe, is God just kind of full of himself? Is he conceited? I mean, who does that? That's not really good. Well, can I offer something to you? Because what we're trying to get at is this. We're trying to answer this question. Is God for us as, as America? Is God for us? And the reason that I needed to take this little journey to this place is to try and help us look at this question in a different way. And here's the way that I wanna propose it to you. God must be for himself if he is to be for us. God must be for himself if he's to be for us. Let me help you think about that in a different way. What could God do? Uh, let me say it this way. What could God give if God were giving something to you to show that he is supremely loving, what, what would he give to you? Don't answer out loud, because I'm not trying to, you know, I don't want anybody to answer, and then I say something different, and you're like, oh. And then people are going, Pff. right? Listen, but if we're answering this question, what would God give to us to show that he is supremely loving? Here's the answer. Himself, of course. Himself. Because he is incomparable. Because he is the source of satisfaction. Because he is our everything. Because in him is life. Because in him is freedom. You see, what God would give us to demonstrate how supremely loving he is, is he would give us himself, of course. So, listen, this could help you. So when we see that God exalts himself, when we see that God 
is about his own glory, then what we understand that to be is not God being conceited, but God being supremely loving. Because the greatest gift that any human being could ever receive from God is himself, is God. So why does God concern himself with his own glory? Why is God about self-exaltation? Why is God about self-glory? Because God has to be for himself for him to be for us. Because he is our greatest good. He is our greatest satisfaction. He is our greatest love. You see, this is a really important way that I think that we need to view God because if we don't, we start getting turned around because we just skip over those phrases that talk about God's glory and all that stuff and we say them because they're kind of cultural. Yeah, I'm just, I'm doing this for God's glory. Well, that's great, but do you understand what that means? It means that ultimately when your life is fulfilling its destiny before God, that what it's doing is it is making much of God. And do you know why that's important? It's important because everyone in the world needs God. They need to see God. They need to meet God because God is the only source of their satisfaction and their hope for this life and the life to come. God must be for himself if he is to be for us. That's why the commander of the army of the Lord stood in front of Joshua and he said, well, whose side are you on? And he said, neither. Why? Because he's on his own side. His holiness teaches us that. And he is our greatest need. You see, our destiny is fulfilled when we're living out the praise of his glory. That's what we see in the book of Ephesians. In chapter one, listen to what verse 11 says. In him, speaking of Christ, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for what? For the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. To what? To the praise of his glory. Why is that so important? It's so important because the world needs God. More specifically, the world needs Jesus. You see, as Americans, I think that maybe when we're asking the question, whether innocently and subconsciously or not, we're asking the question, is God on our side? Is God for us? Instead of asking that question as a nation, so to speak, why don't you as an individual ask this question, am I on God's side? Am I on God's side? So, well, Jerry, I... What does it mean to be on God's side? Listen, it means to be on the right side of the cross. That's what it means to be on God's side. It means to be on the right, not right as in right and left, but right as in right and wrong. It means to be on the right side of the cross. You see, the wrong side of the cross is to think that we can appeal to God based upon our own merit that we can appeal to God based on if we'll just do some stuff that we can make God do some other things. That's the wrong side of the cross. The right side of the cross is to understand grace. That God in his infinite goodness and his infinite glory and his infinite holiness has come down among us who are sinful people and he has offered his one and only son who gave himself willingly on our behalf to take our sin to die on a cross to pay for it, to rise from the dead, demonstrating the sufficiency of the sacrifice. And this was done not because of your merit, this was done because of who he is. That's the right side of the cross. The wrong side of the cross is to hang on to bitterness and to wrath. The right side of the cross is to understand forgiveness, which is what God has offered us in his son. 
The wrong side of the cross is hate. The right side of the cross is love. This is what God has demonstrated to the world through the gift of his son. You see, at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, the only way that God's gonna be for us is if he's for himself. And God's the one who has initiated all of this by his grace. And instead of asking the question, is God on our side, maybe we should ask the question, am I on God's side? And so I would pose that to you. Are you on the right side of the cross? Have you embraced what God through his son has done on your behalf? Let's bow together for prayer. We're gone in just a moment. and If you don't have to move, I'd ask you not to out of kindness to the people that are around you. If you're here and you've never before entrusted your life to Jesus, then I would say this to you. God loves the world so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not have to experience separation from him eternally but could come into a faith relationship with him, be changed now and for forever. And if that's you and that's your need, then I would suggest to you that that's your greatest need because God is your greatest need. He's your sole source of satisfaction. He is everything. And for us to, to look differently than that to say that, well, you know, I'm kind of living my life, doing my thing, and I hope it works out in the end, is to trample underfoot the precious blood of his son, Jesus. It's to stand on the wrong side of the cross. So if your need is to entrust your life to Christ, when we dismiss in just a moment, if you're in this room or in the East Worship Center, I'll ask you to come through the fireside room. If you're at the Lockport campus, Pastor Jonathan's gonna give you some instruction. If you're online, check click the Knowing Jesus tab and get some more information there. And I would just simply say to you, uh, I wanna leave that in your hands. If God, the Holy Spirit, is moving your heart, calling you to himself, then come by the fireside room if you're here and let us take an opportunity to talk to you about what that means. We'll just take a few moments. We won't keep you all afternoon. Let us do that. Father, we thank you that we can have our minds renovated about the nature of who you are. That sometimes your word just causes us to pause and to reflect and to stop and to meditate and to think that maybe this God that we have sometimes crafted in our own image, and God, I know that uh, my perception of you still needs work. That this God that we've crafted sometimes in our image is not who you are. That you're not just the God of beautiful, park, uh, beautiful golf days and front parking spaces at the mall. But you're holy. And your holiness says that you're on your own side. And your holiness calls us to be people who, through the cross of Jesus Christ and his resurrection, embrace your side. I pray you'd help us to be mindful of that. We're privileged and we deeply thank you for the country that we live in, the freedoms that are here that we can meet and gather and preach the gospel. And we ask God for your continued grace and mercy and wisdom to those who lead this country. But Father, we recognize that there is a kingdom far greater than our geography. It's the kingdom of our God. There aren't any geographical bounds on this holy nation called the church. That your bride, your body is everywhere. It's all over the world. Help us to be reminded that we are on your side because of the grace you have shown us. And help shape our perspective of you in such a way that we have a healthy understanding of who you are. Because when we do, it overwhelms us with gratitude. Because we recognize that it is all from your hand. That grace is more than we ever dreamed or imagined. 
So Lord, we love you. I pray that you would give courage and strength to those who you have called this day to entrust their lives to you. That you would fill us with the reminder of your grace in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy fourth to everybody. God bless you.